Orthodoxy holds that 65 million years ago, a gigantic asteroid shook the Earth and engulfed the surface of our planet in flames. To guarantee the extinction of the terrestrial dinosaurs as well as of the great sea-dwelling mosasaurs, the paleontologists incorporated an impact winter mechanism. A cloud of dust encapsulates the Earth blots out the sun, and interrupts photosynthesis for several years, selectively killing even some of the seafaring plankton. Plants died, animals died, in the air, on land, and sea. Had it not been for that lucky strike, the experts claim, the dinosaurs would still be roaming the earth and we would still be puny mammals scrambling at their feet. If the experts have their way, had the trilobites of the Cambrian managed to dodge comets, they would still be around today. Spectacular impact theories make for great Hollywood movies, but they cannot explain selectivity, specifically chronological selectivity. How does the impact winter mechanism discriminate between the ancient and the recently evolved species? How does an asteroid kill the ancient dinosaurs and spare the upwardly mobile mammals, reptiles, and insects? How does it kill the ancient ammonites and mosasaurs and leave the modern turtles, crocs, sharks, and fish alive? How does brimstone and fire burn the already contracting forests of conifers and cycads and leave Mother Nature's latest invention, the flowering plants, intact? Why does a mass extinction always occur when the breeds are fully developed rather than when the lineages are just starting out? Let's propose a rational mechanism that is consistent with the geological and fossil record. We will assume that there is an island populated by ancient plants. The island is surrounded by newer, more advanced plants. The ancient regime is besieged on all sides. Herbivores marked in red have developed very close symbiotic relationships with the plants on the island. Carnivores, marked in blue, prey upon these herbivores. Meanwhile, recent inventions of Mother Nature, tiny animals have allied themselves with the expanding plants, which gradually choke the island. The island shrinks. The remnants of these ancient families have developed into formidable exemplars, the most evolved of their lineages but they are oblivious to the fact that they are stranded on a shrinking island. One day, they're gone. Having no further restrictions, the newcomers increase in size, diversity, and numbers, and history repeats itself. Could this mechanism have done away with a T-Rex? Let's look at the objective facts. T-Rex and Triceratops made their last stand in northwestern United States about 65 million years ago. They were probably the last of the dinosaurs. After ruling the planet for 160 million years, biological diversity decreased to alarming proportions in the last 2 million years of the Cretaceous. The late Cretaceous Judith River formation in Alberta, Canada had three large duckbills and three horned triceratops-like dinosaurs 10 million years before the KT boundary. However, in the last 2 million years of the Cretaceous, at the Scholard, 75% of the duckbills were represented by a single hadrosaur, and triceratops outnumbered all other large herbivores combined 3 or 4 to 1. The last days of the Cretaceous found the apex predator, T-Rex, depending on practically a single species of herbivores. A more telling fact is that 90% of the species of plants discovered in this region 
were flowering plants. There are about a handful of species of ginkgos and cycads, the plants that had ruled the planet throughout the Jurassic and the early part of the Cretaceous. The Triceratopses were obviously having trouble finding food. Indeed, most researchers testify that the KT extinction was a result of widespread starvation. The ancient food chains disappeared. The more recent food chains were unaffected. We see the same pattern in other extinctions. The age of amphibians was the Carboniferous, which was also the age of horsetails and club mosses. When the water-loving mosses and horsetails vanished, so did the water-loving amphibians. The Permian was the age of the Pelicosars and Therapsids, and also the age of ferns, a hotter and drier age. It was to be expected that when the ferns disappeared, so would the mammal-like herbivorous synapsids. The Jurassic was the age of cycads, cycadioids, and conifers. It was to be expected that when these plants disappeared, so would the fauna that had developed a close relationship with them. We see this pattern even in the Cretaceous seas. The ancient mosasaurs fed on ammonites, which fed on ancient types of plankton. When the plankton disappear, all three groups vanish. A mass extinction is the last stage of a long cycle for families of plants. When they go or become significantly reduced in numbers, the animals that depend on them go with them. Mass extinctions are not caused by asteroids, volcanic activity, disease, or climate change. A mass extinction has to do with economics. With the overturning of the ecological pyramid, the many chasing after the few. The cause of a mass extinction is starvation. The astronomers routinely scan the night skies with their telescopes, watching out for a gargantuan asteroid that might bring destruction to our beloved human race. And the environmentalists maul the politicians, urging them to do something about pollution and global warming. All of them should be dusting the books and brushing up on ecology. If there is a lesson to be learned in paleontology, it is that species do not live forever. Mother Nature schedules species to die from the day they are born. The big picture is that after millions of years, plant species are crowded out by new ones. The animal species that have carved a niche in this vegetation cannot switch their diets overnight, any more than you can switch from lettuce to pine leaves overnight. This theory is about to be tested soon with the upcoming extinction of man. Almost 7 billion people will be living through this extraordinary event. That's the subject of the next video in this series.